On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Fani Paidamari. He is the head of strategic planning and partnerships at Healthcare Service Corporation. We're going to be talking about productizing your data, and we're going to be diving into some of the areas of, of opportunities, some of the challenges, some of the gaps, uh, some of the common mistakes, and just the mindset required to view product as and productizing data. I think that's a big thing that is going on. A lot of people don't know how to do it or are, are doing it incorrectly. And I think Vani is going to come on to share with us uh, his insights. And I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, Vani, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Omer. Definitely looking forward to a great conversation. Fantastic. I, I, I definitely appreciate it. I guess before we start, um, Head of Strategic Planning and Partnerships, uh, tell us what, what, that, what that means and, and then tell everyone, if you could, uh, what the healthcare service corporation does and we'll dive on in after that sure absolutely so healthcare service corporation is a mutual reserve company with licensees across uh, five states of blue cross blue shields illinois texas new mexico montana and oklahoma i am part of the enterprise data and analytics solutions organization trying to really support the data analytics ai and insights capabilities across uh, the five plan states my role um, Unlike my background from being a data leader and delivery focused uh, kind of executioner is more around building partnership framework for HCSC. What that really means is HCSC is a, an organization that has been investing in data analytics for the last seven to eight years successfully. We have a full-time employee count of about 400 um, employees across the spectrum of data analytics, including data engineering, data science, analytics, BI, AI capabilities. And there was a tremendous amount of time and inputs built internally focused. Now is the time for us to start looking at external partnership opportunities to really grow and innovate as an organization. And that's how my role was created. Having been in the data leader space, I do value and understand the value that this particular role is capable of bringing into the organization. And uh, I'm definitely excited uh, to start my journey here. It's just been four months I've been with the organization, but can't uh, look forward for the journey that's up ahead. Awesome, man. It certainly sounds like uh, uh, it's going to require a lot of data strategy. Um, and I guess, you know, maybe we can you know talk about, you know, obviously productizing data. That's going to be the episode. And, you know, I, I guess it means a lot of things to different people, you know, and, and I think that's maybe the challenge of when people think about productizing data. Uh, you know, people think slightly differently to how maybe a software product or other product, but but maybe dive in and help us understand when someone says productizing data, what does that mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I have heard it all, right? Whenever uh, the word product itself, and I, I'd attribute this back to my industry agnostic experience. I've been in manufacturing and supply chain. I was fortunate enough to get opportunities in consumer electronics public sector, and each industry has their own jargon, has their own way of defining what product really means. But I always like the way Gartner kind of defines what product is. Uh, It's a collection of uh, business capabilities that actually drives your customer vision and customer segment that serves the customer. It could be a software product, it could be a data product, it could be a combination of software, hardware, facilities, and services, or it could be a repeatable service, or it could be a platform. There's a bunch of ways on how you would want to call a product as. Um, and this is where the organizations kind of uh, are having a challenge in transitioning from what their traditional product definition is to what this newly defined digital data analytics AI product could be. And uh, uh, that's where uh, I was, again, fortunate enough to get those opportunities in the last few uh, roles. And, and I was able to spend and define uh, the right way of looking at the product when it comes to commercialization, when it comes to data, when it comes to insights, or when it comes to digital, for that matter. Interesting. I I guess when, you know, in your your space, uh, I guess maybe we can use that as a frame of reference. Uh, Obviously, you've done a lot of work within, you know, different areas, different industries, and, and you've seen all kinds of different, you know, approaches. When it comes to, I guess, maybe in the healthcare space, and now you've worked at uh, Black and Decker before, Bo, Sabre. So you've seen all kinds of different permutations of, of, of what it is to productize. When you kind of look at the current company and, and kind of 
you know, I think if someone's listening from a healthcare or, or similar background and you're thinking about productizing data, how, how does that look for, for you when you're differentiating it across, you know, other types of companies you've worked at? Yeah, so there's definitely, let me start, uh, before I start sounding cynical, let me start by giving some positive okay. industry. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, positives to take away, just beginning of transitioning into a product-based organization mindset itself is a big win because it's really hard for companies to really think about being project-driven and project-centric to being a product kind of oriented organization. And it requires significant amount of uh, business transformation, cultural transformation. It's a big change management problem, uh, similar to any other data and analytics initiatives. What I've really seen industries do is really show the intent of getting transformed into being product-driven. But then when it comes to execution, that's where the real challenge lies. I mean, they always say devil is in the details. And once you start transitioning from being a project centric, which is, let me tell you the story, right? I mean, this can this may resonate with most of the audience here, uh, but um, imagine we are a large software company or a company that's doing whatever we are good at. There are multiple teams trying to solve this puzzle uh, across the board. Each team does an amazing job, amazing way of formatting, as well as creating this Rubik's Cube puzzle, or it could be another puzzle with 3,000 small pieces. But we have seen experts and we have seen industry leaders really delivering those product projects successfully by bringing these puzzles together. Now, each vertical is doing an amazing job. But when you think about the transformation from being a project-centric to a product-centric, you would actually have to work together to build a unified product here. Instead of multiple puzzles, maybe you're building a robot. And to build a robot, the legs are being built by one group, the arms are being built by one group, the, the core is being built by another group, and the head and the brain is being built by another group. So imagine all of these teams, if they are operating in their own fashion, the leg could be a blue in color, or it could be operating, it could be walking backwards, and the hand could be just jumping out. So in a corporate setting, this is one of the most common challenges that I've seen across the enterprise, and almost everybody could attribute to the siloed nature within an organization. I've been hearing this, I've been doing this for a while now, and one of the most common challenges that get called out within a conference or a roundtable or a boardroom discussion is basically saying, oh, we're dealing with a lot of silo and we're trying to change the culture. And this becomes a, a roadblock for your journey towards being a product-centric organization. But even before that, do you have the vision of thinking what your North Star is? Is your robot going to be, I don't know, uh, four-legged? Three leg, two leg, one leg, or do you actually want to have it do certain uh, visionary goals that you anticipate it to? Do you want it to deliver pizza or do you want it to deliver uh, Uber Eats kind of service or maybe an Amazon package? So depending on what all of these visions come to put together, you would actually come up with a North Star vision that defines how each one of these verticals need to happen. And the transition across just doing my own thing within my vertical to thinking in a holistic way having the team structured in a consolidated way to be able to be much more feature-driven in a product versus a project and um, not thinking about the entire life cycle is a big, big uh, transition. Any other company, uh, including HCSC, we are going through the transformation. There's definitely been uh, progress made in that, but it's a slow transition when it comes to changing the mindsets, changing the resistance for change, uh, addressing the change uh, ch change management problems across training, quality assurance, and so on kind of takes time. And uh, I would say, I would always start off by saying, it starts with the organizational culture. It starts with the organizational maturity. It starts with resource allocation and skill set match because you need the talent or you need to upskill your existing talent to be able to be prepared for the transition, but not just preparing them, but also letting them or giving them the tools and skill sets to be successful with this transition as well. And here's where it can get really tricky once you start going deep down into the areas. There are, I've been at organizations which call themselves as agile, and uh, there are goods and bad, right? There's good that works, uh, work is being done in an agile fashion. There are daily standups that happen in a product kind of manner. But then eventually the product is being managed and operated as a project. So it's, it, it's being looked at as, okay, I just launched this feature and I'm going to disband this team completely. And that's fundamentally uh, opposing to the concept of uh, product management. You have individual skill sets across the board. You have data 
architects, you have enterprise architects, you have solution architects, or you have data engineers, data analysts, data scientists, uh, AI engineers, and so on. And each of these become COE. And each of the feature, you get, you build uh, the for a team, and then you bring them out. And the demand kind of drives these conversations as well. And again, it's, it's a work in progress as I see. And then um, the way p- companies are measuring the success around being product driven is also different for different companies. It's again, it doesn't have to be same. I'm not actually proposing like one set of metrics for each organization. It's never going to work. There's never a one size fits all that kind of works. But eventually how you think about defining what success really means to you defines those metrics for you, defines those goals for you. And uh, the organizational leadership kind of are critical for the success of uh, something like that to be happening. I, I guess, you know, we, we, I think that's a great explanation. I think the one thing when I was listening and my mind was starting to go towards, you know, what the software engineering side does, right? Because obviously they have a lot of feedback loops. Um, they have a lot of, uh, you know, designated people doing specific tasks. It's a, it's, it's a pretty well-defined you know, model, you know, depending on what framework you're implementing with, it doesn't really matter, but there's, you know, product managers, there's analysts, there's, you know, people feeding information back from customer success, whatever that looks like for your team. If it's, you know, front customer service people or some, you know, whatever that, you know, component would be for your company. There's a lot of that feedback that's happening. There's people out there trying to establish that roadmap, trying to flush out features because they know how long it takes for, software to be delivered. Then you have data, where data is, is, the complexity has exploded. I mean, back in the day, you could have everything on one laptop like you could for software engineering and you you code. Now data is as complicated as a software product. And you don't see the, the, the same type of, I guess, people yet in these roles. I mean, you do see data product managers. It's not common. Um, you know, you typically have the VP or director, or whoever's head of data, playing that role, going out, setting the roadmap while they're still executing, which is like asking a software engineering leader to go, hey, you go plan a roadmap and deliver with your team. Talk about some of those, right? If we're trying to think about productizing data and we have software development there as a reference point for a lot of companies, is that a gap or, or is that just, hey, two different beasts, you know, there's similarities, but this is not exactly how it's going to work. Yeah, the framework across both of these is similar, right? You're looking at the foundational product management framework across both of these, but the major difference comes in when you're actually executing. Uh, To your exact point, the engineers actually, software engineers are well equipped to be and be self-sufficient with one environment and one consolidation. And there are roles even within data product teams, which could be doing that. But then there is a larger vision in terms of how the product needs to be defined. And the role of data product manager you uh, referred to is just getting started. Um, companies have just started hiring those data product manager roles, and we have seen quite a few of those show up in the market in the last maybe one to two years. And uh, even that role is pretty vaguely defined at the moment. There's clarity or lack of uh, clarity in terms of what the roles and responsibilities will be for a data product manager to the point where I've seen data product manager role being acting as a delivery agent, purely a project management of task track kind of a role. Um, so the I, the eventual idea is to mature those data product management roles to really envision and own the data, uh, the product itself, the vision of the product, the, the deliverable within the feature down to the sprint level and really track it back to the overall product lifecycle. One of the critical factors and distinguishing factors is when you have a software product in place, you can easily have, or I won't say easily, but um, you can at at least have a a life cycle in mind for that particular product, at least for the version. You can create versioning of the product and it can go on for a certain amount of time from a development life cycle. When it comes to data product, they're usually either a a data extract in the form of an API or could actually look at uh, data visualization that uh, gets either embedded or into a from of the data visualization tools that are out there in the market or you actually do edge computing and edge uh, data science and ai capabilities or you have a rules based engine that actually runs on another product to create a life cycle against these is quite not similar to a software product so here's another distinction where you would have to maintain 
even though the overall product definition is pretty small as as small as an api being built that's still a product you would still have to consider that to be a product and the api um should also be thought through from a life cycle management can we actually enable capabilities or features for this particular api to add or remove some of these attributes that we are exposing out to the customer can we actually create a a unified um, um, entry point for all future API requests and so on. So it it goes all the way down to a single point solution to a really creating a larger ecosystem of those solutions put together, which is, which is also a data product. I've been at uh, places where we build digital products, right? We're calling them digital products. The reason I'm calling them digital products is these are products like mobile applications, but heavily run by AI and uh, data science capabilities on them. There's a lot of data visualization capabilities on them. And I'm sure there are a lot of mobile apps. Uh, consider Amazon.com. We could actually go navigate and uh, do a lot of, and it's a data product for me um, because there's a lot of AI running behind. There's a lot of data pipelines. There's a lot of data in integration that's happening across. And uh, if I am a user, I could go into my profile and look for my own purchase behavior and so on. It's a data product. But do we really call Amazon.com or Amazon Mobile App a data product right now? Is not. I mean, it's still being looked at a, a, a e-commerce a portal that's being sold out. So again, that's another mindset that needs to be changed uh, as well. Um, so having all said all of these, I think it makes sense for uh, us to define um, what data product really is and what is the family of data products are for an individual organization. Like I mentioned, the list of products that I called out could be just a starting point. And there's a bunch more that you would want to add as part of data products. How would you really define who the owner is? Like define the product owner role versus a product manager role because the product owner could be somebody in the business, somebody in the marketing department who's actually defining what the product should be or how would um, a data product developer or a data product manager could define those features down. So there should be an ownership attached to it. There should also be a user-centric approach. I mean, same thing with software products. You need to plan on your UI, UX design design uh, capabilities, as well as keeping the end user, the consumer in mind while you're defining these products as well. And eventually plan for a, a life cycle of that. Um, most likely what, what I've seen is a possibility in data products is there will always be an end of life. It may be six months, it may be one year, because once the data is providing the proof of value for that particular solution or that particular timeline, you would actually have to make sure that the product comes off shelf. You don't keep maintaining those products because it's overhead, cost overhead, which is what is also being overlooked at right now. Um, so I called out a lot of things, but then eventually I think uh, the data product capabilities need to be looked at uh, in similar to a software product with some nuances that were called out earlier. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it actually does. It's interesting because um... You know, I think we're talking about, you know, overall, we're talking about the vision, establishing where we want the product to go, the data product to go, opportunities. And I think there's a piece of data that's very still reactive for companies that it's like, hey, I need this. And then the chain reaction is lots of people scrambling to go fulfill an executive's desire for these data points. And all of a sudden, you know, you have people that are now running in that direction. And then obviously you have, you know, the thought of, hey, can we productize data? Can we get in front of this? Can we actually start building uh, a, a better you know, roadmap, better view of what data can drive? It, is there a component that your know, data is viewed as reactive or, or is that still part of the mindset shift that needs to happen and kind of move it towards a revenue driver and not just providing the, the data points to, you know, in, in, on the fly as, as most people would really like? Yeah, so there's always two components to how you would look at a uh, data product. There's, there's an internal consumer of the product and an external consumer of the product. Internal consumer is where you would want to look at ad hoc capabilities, ad hoc questions that get answered. You can't answer, you can't have answers for all of the questions. So there's always going to be a reactive. And that's why we're tracking data. That's the reason why we're actually capturing the data, keeping the history of the data to be able to identify and answer those questions on an on-demand basis. But then there are ways for us to build products on top of it that could be much more uh, used to fast track these responses. Like you mentioned, we can avoid the situation of 10 different teams coming together to answer that question. It comes down to the discipline. It comes down to the maturity of the data and analytics organization to be able to build solutions which are much more innovative using emerging technologies, using advanced uh, analytics capabilities like NLP, 
Um, just uh, now with uh, generative AI, we could use large language models to use simple uh, language based questions that could uh, that the model could respond back to. In the end, of, at the end of the day, what I've seen executive say is dashboards are good, but I can't actually navigate and get my answer in half a second or two seconds or five seconds, right? It takes time for them to really go through and identify those insights. Now, can you actually enable a capability on top of that using generative AI, using another solution that could just spit out the insights? What is the key metrics that are out there? And there are products that are out there in the market which are trying to do this. But exactly, that that's where you actually focus more on internally productizing data products. Whereas from an external standpoint, you have a completely external view from a user-centric approach to if, if there is a scenario of external products. There are companies which are still looking only internally and there's nothing wrong in that. But um, yeah, there's always going to be descriptive. There's always going to be predictive and prescriptive from an analytics standpoint. So I guess that, that kind of segues to if a company is looking internal only and they haven't started thinking about external, there's there's, there's a lot out there. What do they want to start? What are some easy ways? Well, easy is a bad term here. What are some ways that they can start looking at that, right? They got to maybe, and again, we're talking about a mindset shift. We're talking about how to productize. But if you're, let's say you're at a company where, hey, everything I do is internal, it's internal. How can I productize this for an external user potentially that we haven't thought about? What? How do you go about that? Yeah, so there are many, many use cases for internal consumption, uh, and uh, some of the standard functions exist across different industries, like the marketing, finance, operations, IT, security. All of these are like standard functions across the board. And if you're looking at internal insights and analytics and really, say, uh, empowering the internal communities by building products for them, there are certain standard use cases across these uh, all of these functions which could be productized. You know that the product is everlasting, an executive dashboard that gives a 360 degree view of a marketing spend. You can't expect that to be like dying down after a month or two or three. It's a ever living uh, inside capability and everybody wants the visibility into the marketing capabilities and the ROI spent on that. You would also always want to look at your um, your expenses and costs and your overall uh, balance sheet kind of reporting. That's that's evergreen and almost every company is having that right now in the form of spreadsheets, in the form of uh, dashboards, in the form of uh, maybe tools uh, that are out there doing the uh, budgeting and forecasting FP&A kind of capabilities. So, so that's another area that uh, that could be productized and standardized as well. Similarly, in the other areas from a supply chain uh, management standpoint and so on. But one other area that's also picking up a lot of steam is to really look at your key data elements. Um, Customer, if you actually are serving a customer, define the customer and really creating a 360 for that particular customer, really building a product around the customer. If you are a product company, building a 360 degree view around the product, completely end-to-end visibility in terms of what the product is getting built across, what it comprises of. Does it come with, I don't know, 360 parts or is it one product that gets built across 300 different uh, manufacturers? So depending on how the view is, you could actually build a 360 degree view of product uh, internally and so on. So there's tremendous amount of opportunity to be looked at across the different functions of organizations and data leaders, that's why are highly crucial. They are like, they have to be looked at as a salesman. They have to be looked at as a marketer. They have to be looking at themselves as a, a finance uh, or a business person or a strategy person, uh, account management, whatnot, right? Eventually, I, got, I call the data and analytics leaders to be, um, in fact, I've used this in one of my prior uh, panel discussions was, we are uh, conductors of an orchestra. There's an orchestra, each of them playing different instruments. They could still do an amazing job just playing one instrument. But if you don't bring them together, you wouldn't get the amazing vocal or a sound that comes out. And that's the job of a chief data officer or an analytics officer. Internal products. Your job is to purely look at getting the best out of the music uh, that gets played out across. Interesting. I guess when you're when you're looking at some of these opportunities, and you know, obviously you've you've seen this done in a couple of different places. When people are going about the process of trying to understand how to productize data, what are some of those you know common mistakes? What are, what do they potentially perceive as an opportunity to productize data that might be not the case? 
Yeah, the, the common, most common challenge is not having uh, a vision, like a clear vision. Um, it's a complex environment we all live in, complex ecosystem where there are multiple verticals, multiple channels coming up with their own vision. But eventually at an organizational level, if, if you don't have a common vision, then it gets hard for you to define the product definition, come up with a business problem definition, and then really convert that into a technical solution. So having a clear vision or lack of is the, one of the common mistakes, starting off building, getting into the execution mode without completely defining what the North Star could be one of the common mistakes. Organizational change management is the biggest problem too. Irrespective of having dedicated change management teams, there's always resistance to change in large organizations. Um, so that that con continues to stay as a, a challenge as well as a mistake that um, kind of plays in. Resource allocation kind of becomes critical because sometimes you're over, over allocating or under allocating depending on what your product is and uh, not having the right balanced uh, mix of agile teams that can norm and form based on your product definition is highly crucial for uh, the success of being product driven. Again, a goals driven, metrics driven, can you actually define your metrics of success? Can you define those milestones that actually define the metrics kind of becomes highly crucial and uh, not having clear definitions of these metrics or goals kind of become a, a big challenge or hindrance for success as well. The last or maybe last but one is uh, sometimes I, I have been uh, um, guilty of this too, but uh, we tend to over-engineer our product solutions too. We tend to be spending a lot of time just trying to say, okay, I want the perfect to really go out in the market. I want the best version to be out there, which is basically killing your um, uh, overall progress. So they say um, perfection is the the slower or the, or the killer of uh, the progress, right? So there's definitely a lot of progress that could be made without having to be uh, perfect. But again, uh, if you don't want to be perfect, you want to be iterative, you want to be um, continuously developing, then that's also another area. You want to focus on continuous development as well. Maybe the lot, la, last is also around the concept of product ownership. Who is the one who's actually owning the product? Who has the keys to the kingdom in terms of defining what the product needs to do? Needs to be clearly identified. And uh I have seen places where the product ownership gets tossed around different groups, not knowing who is the right owner is. It could be somebody raising a hand and saying, I'm the product owner, but then it's up to us to validate whether that's the right product owner or that's the right role to own the product or not. So anybody who's close to the customer kind of has the maximum visibility in this. But these are some of the, the challenges, uh, potentially uh, bottlenecks uh, that could occur that happen on a frequent basis that I've seen. Awesome, man. I was uh, talking to him at the time. Um, I think it's a topic we can uh, dive into for a while. I think we, I, you're, you're, you're an expert. I could have you keep talking, but I know I let you. I have to get you back to your uh, day job. But um, you know, before I let you go, a couple things. Um, how should somebody reach out to you if they want to talk to you about productizing data, right, or anything else that's you know, relevant to your background? Obviously, you have a deep background in, in the space. Uh, what's a good way of getting a hold of you? Yeah, LinkedIn is the best way. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. There's a lot of activity and outreaches that happen. People connect. Uh, my network's growing on a daily basis. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's the best way possible. Okay, awesome. And you know, if if we, I could ask you, if there was a topic that you'd like to hear about, um, you know, showcase on the show at a, at a future time, what would you like to hear about? Yeah, so another passionate topic that I have had the opportunity to work on and I'm also looking to learn more as we speak and learn on a daily basis is around the growth strategies. How can products, data products, digital products really drive growth for organizations? I mean, consider you're not a software company. There's tremendous opportunity for traditional companies to really drive new revenue opportunities growth opportunities. In fact, my role at Stanley Black & Decker was focused around creating new revenue stream of products by building digital products. And I'm always passionate and uh, to learn where organizations are really thinking and having their mind to drive digital products rather than just the traditional way of uh, looking at corporate strategy and uh, driving the new revenue opportunities. There's another stream of potential that I'm always looking and tapping into. So I would love to learn more about that. Awesome. Well, thank, thanks again for coming on. Actually, I think that's a really great topic, by the way. Uh, but I appreciate you coming on, sharing um, your, your time and, and, and all that. So thank you very much. I, I, I hopefully will uh, 
uh, find somebody to talk about that growth strategies of digital data products or even a roundtable. I might have to have you come on with a couple of guests and do a roundtable because I was thinking that could be a really good one. I'd love to. Yeah. That's it for this episode. We'll be back again, different guests, different topic. You know, if you do know somebody that wants to participate, I, I actually think it's a great idea to do a panel discussion because there could be a lot of points of view and a lot of different strategies around digital and data productization, um, growing revenue streams. Um, would love to do that. So I think I'm going to put that on my uh, uh, roadmap to get that set up and done. Um, secondly, if you do like the podcast, if it's been useful, if it's been helpful, share it with somebody else. That's really how this uh, podcast has been growing. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, do all the things that help us grow. I appreciate it. Until next time, thank you and goodbye.